Welcome to this episode of Horrific History and Hauntings. I'm Beth. And I'm Ramey. We're your hosts, here to talk about the stories that the history books ignore. From horrific epidemics and ghostly hauntings to the catastrophes and tragic events that have sickened humanity. Beth, Mm -hmm. what are we talking about? We are going to talk about the legend of the black-eyed children. I've heard of the black-eyed peas. No, no, this is not that. They're not as cheery. Well, did the Mothman have, like, weird-eyed agents or something that showed up at people's houses? I don't know if they had weird eyes. I, I don't remember. Thinking, maybe it was the book we listened to. Something mentioned something's eyes. Book. I kept thinking about, wow, their eyes would really be unnerving. I might be very wrong. There's something similar to that later on in this episode. But before we get into that, I have a This Day in History. What happened this day in history? It is January 1st. Happy New Year's. Oh, yeah. Happy New Year's. I forgot about that. January 1st. 1923, a white mob attacked the black town of Rosewood, Florida. There were approximately 200 residents in the mill town at the time, and this attack lasted for days and destroyed the once thriving community of about 200 people. People are mean. Yes. They set buildings on fire and beat and shot the black residents because earlier that day, a white woman named Fanny Taylor in the nearby town of Sumner claimed she was attacked by a black man. Was that true? I don't know. A neighbor went to check on her, and he, well, I don't know if it was a he or she, but they seen that she had actually been beaten. Okay, so somebody looked had. like she had. Okay. Her husband gathered a mob to hunt this man down. And he got the whole town instead somehow. <laughs> the official 1993 Florida State report on the incident mentioned that some of the people in the community said they saw a white man with Fanny before the attack which led to the rumors that she falsely blamed a black man to cover possibly an affair up. The sheriff jumped to conclusions, and he blamed a prisoner. I think this person was out of prison at the time. Jesse Hunter, he got blamed for the white woman's assault. There was no proof. There's no the proof of anything. The sheriff jumped to conclusions. Other than the fact she probably was actually attacked by someone. It, according to the neighbor, she looked as if she had been attacked. White mobs claiming to hunt Hunter had unleashed a multi-day attack. They burned homes and churches, and they shot at the residents when they tried to escape the flames. That's terrible. Several men were lynched as well. Many fled in terror and hid in nearby swamps. And this kind of behavior isn't confined to Florida. It Oh, no. It happened all over the place. Yeah. This is just one of many that just happened to be in Florida. While the estimates vary, at least six black residents and two white attackers lost their lives. News painted Rosewood residents as crim- criminals for fighting back. Yes. This drew in more white men and even the Ku Klux Klan. It sounds like some of them might have been there already. Yeah. <laughs> Probably. Sounds like it. A few residents managed to escape by train to Gainesville. The story of Rosewood was buried for decades until a journalist from the St. Petersburg Times wrote an article about it in 1982. The aging survivors finally demanded justice from the state, and in 1994, Florida offered reparations to the nine remaining survivors and some of the descendants. The nine remaining survivors received $150,000 each in cash, and some of the descendants got. $2,000, $2,000, some of them got a little bit more. Now we know what the price on life is, but <laughs> considering they've done it at all, it's yeah. surprising. Yeah, I think it also mentioned that this was one of the first bills that was passed to try to make an attempt to, I don't, I'm not going to say fix what they did, but reprimand? Acknowledge. Uh, acknowledge, the there we go. When was this done? The bill was passed in 1994. This bill also established a scholarship for Rosewood descendants. And in 1997, a filmmaker, John Singleton, portrayed the tragic events of this massacre in his movie, Rosewood. I might want to watch that. From what I understand, it's a dramatized movie. Now, imagine polite kids. Where do you find those? I don't know. Uh Maybe in their preteens approaching you late at night. They ask for a ride, a phone call, just something out of place to ask a stranger as a child. I mean, a ride in these days is weird. A child's been taught not to do that. Yeah. A phone call, I'll maybe, walk. if a child is lost. I don't care how far I have to walk. I will walk before I will get in a vehicle with a straight. And I'm 29. You know, I pick up strangers occasionally. You'll be making a podcast about me one day. Yeah. I'm here alone because <laughs> Ramey didn't listen. <laughs> His dumb ass. I've done it more than once. Then you look at these kids, and you notice that their eyes are completely black. Okay, that's a bit weird. It's one big pupil. The supernatural demon kind of thing from the show. No white. My first reaction would probably be, 
what kind of drugs have you been doing? This kid needs to get to a hospital. Yeah. How old are they? Like it, I think it said they range from 6 to 16. That's a I'll, 10 year gap. It'll be later on. Oh, no, it's right here. Ranging in age from 6 to 16 years old. I'd be alarmed just because. Why it, are you speaking to me? Uh, leave uh, me alone. Even without your black eyes, leave me alone. I mean, maybe they're not supposed <laughs> to be there. And then a parent's like, oh, they kidnapped them or something. You just yeah. don't take a chance. Best bet is just call the police and say, this kid needs help. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, they told me they needed help and I'm afraid to mess around. <laughs> yeah. Give a child a ride. No. Yeah. <laughs> They're described as having pale skin, as I mentioned, from ages 6 to 16 years old. The skin can be pale, olive colored, or some have described it as having unusual color tints. The green child needs help. <laughs> well, <officer>. not exactly. <laughs> it's They describe it as if they knew that they had abnormally colored or abnormally pale skin and they tried to put too dark of or orange colored makeup on it to cover it. They're also described as wearing outdated clothing. Sometimes they look as if they grabbed clothes out of a dumpster or were just in hand-me-downs that are dirty and don't fit properly. Maybe they they all have scurvy because they can't get good clothes. They are dumpster diving. And because they have scurvy and can't afford citrus, they have just, their skin's changed. Maybe. That's a theory that I didn't write down. Yes, scurvy kids. Witnesses have also described them as behaving strangely for the modern times. They speak in an overly polite or old-fashioned manner, and they speak in a robotic or repetitive voice as if speaking to a customer service AI voice over the phone, and Uh they don't understand what you're saying or they just don't care what you say. The fake responses that you get? Yeah. That's going to change the new AI models, I'm sure. Let's hope so. They become pushy and eventually turn aggressive if denied their request to come inside of a home or get into a vehicle. I just offer them a glass of orange juice and say, (laughs) wait for somebody else. They prefer to stay in groups. Usually two or more of them show up. Can you imagine a group of uh, like a a six-year-old, a 10-year-old, and a 16-year-old showing up and being (laughs) odd and then outright belligerent? Yeah. (laughs) This isn't a daycare center. One will usually stand a little bit in front of the others, and that one is usually the one that does all of the speaking, as if it's the leader. (laughs) The smallest and youngest looking one. (laughs) Hello, kind sir. Do you have an orange? (laughs) I don't think I heard any of the stories of the black-eyed children asking for an orange or any fruit. It's because they're children that don't know what they need. People who meet them report feeling instantly terrified, and some even say they feel dizzy or paralyzed. Many have described a foul smell that lingers long after the black-eyed children have disappeared. (laughs) Dumpster diving. (laughs) Maybe that's true. They just haven't bathed in a while. The first modern-day story came from Brian Bethel. It was 1996 in Abilene, Texas. He was a journalist, and at the time, he was outside Camelot Communications at around 9.30 to 10 p.m. He was writing a check while sitting in his car, when he was startled by tapping at his car window. It was two young boys. He described one as having olive skin with dark curly hair, and the other was pale with freckles and red hair. The olive skin boy stood in front of the red-haired one and was the only one to speak. Do they all seem like they're the same age group when they show up together? That'd be interesting to know. Or are they all, like I said, scattered ages and even more unusual to see together? I'm not sure. Well, there's one later on. It may answer our question. Okay. The olive-skinned boy requested a ride to their mother's house to retrieve the money that they had forgotten to watch the movie Mortal Kombat at the movie theater across the road. Brian described their behavior as strange and robotic. When he didn't immediately answer, the boy began to insist, saying things such as, Come on, mister, we are just little boys. All the more reason for you not to get in my vehicle. Yeah. (laughs) How do you think I would look if you <laughs> two young boys at 9.30, 10 o'clock at night just hopped in my vehicle? I was trying to not say that, but yeah, <laughs> it does come across as really weird. Yeah. Brian then looked up to find that their eyes were pitch black. Even though he'd already had a strange feeling of fear, was then terrified and locked his car doors. Then he quickly rolled up his window and drove away. <laughs> Toodles. <Yeah>. He <laughs> And before this, he apparently looked at the movie theater schedule board thing, and the movie had already started. They were desperate to get in at that point Mm. then. Yeah. The two little boys became angry and began banging on the window as he drove off. When Brian looked into his rearview mirror, he said the boys had completely disappeared from the empty parking lot, and he said there's no way that they could have gone anywhere that quickly. And then I found another story 
from Iowa. A woman named Sharon ran into a store for a few items. Say that again. I found another story from Iowa. From Iowa? Iowa. <laughs> you put a lot of emphasis on O. Iowa. Iowa? That's how you say Iowa. Is that better? <laughs> Iowa. Iowa. Say it faster. I don't know why you... It's like, I thought Iowa was a planet, okay? <laughs> Iowa. <laughs> Go on. Okay. Sharon ran into a store for a few minutes. She knew she would be no more than five minutes, so she left her son in the SUV in the parking lot. Sounds like a great way to end up on a true crime story. Yep. When she returned to the vehicle, she found an unknown boy sitting uncomfortably close to her son in the back seat. She said they were sitting so close that their legs were touching. Then she noticed that the boy's eyes were jet black and shiny, which caused her to panic even more. And this kid's on drugs and he's offering my kids some. <laughs> She got out of the SUV, jerked open her backseat door, and grabbed her son out of the car. And then she described the black-eyed child as glaring at her as if he was furious. Maybe they're fairies. Mm. Changelings. Mm. She went back into the store to the clerk to tell him about the random boy in her vehicle. And when the clerk went outside to investigate, the boy was nowhere to be seen. But the car doors were still open. And now she looks like the... <laughs> Loon. <laughs> Sharon called her husband, Tom, and asked if he could come drive her SUV home while she drove in his vehicle because she was afraid. And he thought it was a strange request, but he could hear the panic in her voice and he agreed. Nice man. Yep. When Tom arrived, he sent his wife and son home in his vehicle. And then he went inside for a moment to discuss the situation with the clerk. And when he got into the SUV, he noticed a foul odor. He said it smelled like an old diaper or something that had been rotting for a while. So he spent a few minutes trying to find whatever it was that was causing this bad smell, and he never found anything. He decided to roll down the windows and just drive home. I guess that's all you can do. Yeah. If you can't find the source of the smell, I guess just walk home <laughs> is the other option. When Sharon arrived home, she began asking her son questions about the boy, such as if he knew the boy somehow, and he said he didn't. She asked him what the boy wanted. Her son replied that he wanted a ride to their house so that they could play. And then she asked if he got in the vehicle without asking for permission. And the boy answered, no, he said I had to tell him to come in. Otherwise, he wouldn't be allowed to get in the vehicle. That's very vampire-y. Yeah, it is. Not long after, Sharon received a call from the hospital. Tom had been in a car accident. He wrapped her SUV around a telephone pole. He just couldn't handle that smell no more. He claimed to remember nothing about the accident and could only remember the foul smell. Of course. Which he thought perhaps may have been gas and caused him to black out, which would cause him to wreck. But he had rolled out down all the windows, so that doesn't make a lot of sense. A few days later, Tom was out of the hospital and their son developed cold-like symptoms. After the symptoms got worse and wouldn't go away, they took him to a doctor, and it turned out he had the flu. Then he began showing symptoms of measles. Oh, I was hoping scurvy. <laughs> no. He was vaccinated for measles, and he did not test positive for it either. Then, after that, he soon suffered rashes, fever, blurred vision, and sores all over his body. That sounds like measles. Sharon wondered if the black-eyed child sitting so close to her son for a longer time is what caused her son's illness. Sharon herself did not feel ill or have any of these problems, but she had only been in the vehicle with the child for a few seconds. They also speculated that maybe Tom had been in an accident due to the lingering stench that the boy had left. Maybe the boy was so furious that he somehow caused the accident even after he was gone. I don't know how that would work, but that's what they speculated. Uh, why not? Blame it on the weird child. Yeah. The next one I have is about Paul, a prison guard. He had just gotten home from his shift as a prison guard. He had just gotten home from his shift. He was home alone because his wife and son were out of town. After changing out of his uniform, he began to make a sandwich when he heard a faint knocking sound. At first, it was so soft that he thought it was just not someone at the door. It was just something random knocking. And then it became heavier, and he realized it was someone at the door. Before he opened the door, he saw through the glass pane two boys wearing dark hoodies on his front porch. He said he didn't recognize the kids from the neighborhood, and he immediately had an unsettling feeling. Because why were random kids <laughs> out so late knocking on a stranger's door? 
When he opened the door, they didn't speak at first. They just stood there with their heads down. And the boy that was standing a little bit in front of the other spoke and said, Hey, we just wanted to stop in for a bit. Obviously, this is a strange request because he didn't know these kids. Yeah. And it was the middle of the night. That's when I slammed the door. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, kids. I'll call the cops to help you, but toodles. Yeah. Paul replied that they must have the wrong house. And the boy spoke again as if speaking from a script or if he hadn't heard Paul at all. He said, It's getting late. Can we come in for a bit? How unusual. Yes. Now, when, what year was this? I don't know what year. I just okay. found the story. When the boy raised his head, Paul noticed that he had black eyes, as if they were only pupil. He said the hair on his neck raised, and he slammed the door shut and yelled at them to get off his porch. I can't blame him. Yeah. He turned away from the door, but when he looked back, he saw a set of jet black eyes staring back at him. And when the boys noticed he was looking at them, they began to knock on the glass again, soft at first and then harder. This is going to be on the point I didn't call 911. I don't know what he's on about. I take no chances. Now, I would think somebody was trying to rob me. I, I wouldn't know if it was the kids or if the kids were put up to it by adults. My first thought would be somebody is trying to rob me. Mm -hmm. And now you got phones. Take pictures. Also, this is another reason you shouldn't play pranks. This wasn't a prank that we know of. Yeah, I mean, it may have been, but Paul ran into the bedroom and grabbed his pistol. When he went outside onto the porch, the boys were gone and he searched around his property, but he found nothing. Later on, he asked his son, after describing the boys, if he knew them and his son didn't know them. So he asked around the neighborhood as well, but nobody knew the boys and hadn't seen them that night. Hey, did you send some strange kids to my house, son? What kind of drugs are they on? <laughs> Do they need some clothes or a bath? Oh, uh, food. Citrus? <laughs> <laughs> and the next story I have is in Vermont, and this couple actually let the children inside. But well, that sounds safe. Now, a woman in Vermont lived with her husband in a small house on a dirt road, and during a snowstorm one night, she heard loud banging on the front door. So she woke her husband up to check it out. She assumed like before that somebody had just gotten into an accident on the slippery roads. And when her husband opened the door, they found two kids, one boy, one girl, around eight years old. Both? About, okay, now they're mm -hmm. boys and girls included. I was getting ready to ask that. It can be boys or girls. Okay. Not always boys. I was also wondering if they're like unisex in groups. <laughs> they said that the kids were dressed strangely, especially for winter weather, and that their heads were tilted down and that they wouldn't make eye contact, but... As a child, I wouldn't make eye contact either. I wouldn't do it now. You remember our kindergarten teacher? I couldn't make eye contact because I just, it's so uncomfortable. I get so nervous. Did she get Maybe. mad about that? She grabbed me and shook me. Wow. I mean, not hard, but still. Yeah. I mean, she wasn't shaking me hard enough to give me like that shake syndrome or anything, but still, like, that's inappropriate. Yeah. They asked if the kids were okay and asked them where their parents were. They replied that their parents would arrive soon. They then asked if they could come inside. The woman, against her instincts, let the kids in the house. She left them in the living room with her husband as she went to the kitchen to make them some cocoa. She could hear her husband talking to the kids and asking them about an accident or where their parents were, trying to figure out what was going on. And they kept avoiding all of the questions and would only say, our parents will be here soon. When she came back to the living room and went to hand the kids the mugs of cocoa, they lifted their heads and that's when she noticed that their eyes were completely black. And when the kids noticed that she was frightened or startled, they asked if they could use the bathroom. So she led them down the hall to her bathroom. Don't be using the weeds in there. <laughs> When she came back, she noticed her husband had his head in his hands, and he said he felt dizzy, but that he was okay. And they discussed it, and he had noticed the children's eyes as well. They're energy vampires. His nose began to bleed, which was unusual for him. He didn't have nosebleeds. Knock on wood, I've never had one. Unless I've been hit in the nose by something, I haven't either. I, I never got hit that hard. Hmm. I play it safe. <laughs> the woman left the room to get her husband some tissues. The power went out. He called her to come back, and when she entered the hallway, she saw the two kids just standing completely still, just not moving in the dark in her hallway. After a bit of staring at each other, the kids said that their parents had arrived, and they walked outside and left the door wide open in the winter in a snowstorm. They went to close the door, and that's when they noticed two men dressed in black suits 
standing by a black car at the end of their driveway. No, the Mothman. I told you there was something about that. I wonder if people in um, the Mothman, West Virginia area, ever encountered black-eyed children. I don't know. I, could, I swear there was something to do with the eyes in those stories, but I can't remember now. When her husband waved at the men, they only stared back at them, didn't wave back. And after a little while of oddly staring at them, because apparently that's what they like to do, they got into the black vehicle and they drove away. See you, kids. <laughs> well, I think they took the kids with them. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I hope. Uh. They didn't say they left the kids. And they yeah. didn't mention having the kids afterward. The power returned after about 30 minutes, but her husband's nose bleeds became a normal occurrence after that well he went to the doctor over it i don't think they found what was causing the nosebleeds but he was diagnosed with an aggressive skin cancer oh goodness and the doctors couldn't explain how he got it and how it spread so quickly because he was rarely ever in the sun and apparently i'm not a doctor they just couldn't figure out why it spread so quickly yeah then the woman began to get nosebleeds and dizzy spells as well, and they never stopped. Did they get it out of Geiger counter? They should have got a Geiger counter. Every guest that comes to my house gets Geiger countered. What's a Geiger counter? It detects rads. Oh, this is a whole house of black-eyed kids in this next one. That's what they should call the black-eyed peas fans. What? Black-eyed black kids? <laughs> I'm a black-eyed kid. <laughs> a healthy, athletic man took a road trip near Arcata, California to visit a friend. Is it Arcadia? It may have been Arcadia. I, I don't know if Arcadia is a place, but I've heard of Ar a lot of Arcadias. It may be Arcadia. I don't know. After visiting, he stopped at a bar for a few drinks before heading back to his hotel room. He ended up striking up a conversation with the attractive bartender. And after serving him a few more drinks, she offered to drive him to her place to stay the night. Okay. Yeah. She said she would drive him back to his car the next morning. So he agreed. She drove them to her home where he immediately began to feel increasingly uneasy. And he said even during their intimate encounter, he was frightened because she acted strangely and exhibited inhuman behavior. She fell asleep after laying there for a while. So he got out of bed around 3 a.m. to get a water from the kitchen. While walking to the kitchen sink, he noticed numerous children roaming around the house which obviously he thought was strange. It was 3 a.m. on a school night. Well, we've done seen the behavior that caused this. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't be judging. He then noticed that all of these kids had completely black eyes and was immediately filled with more terror. I have commitment issues as it is. <laughs> oh. The next morning, the woman did as she said and drove him back to his vehicle. Not really back to his vehicle because she ended up kicking him out along the way. And so he had to walk part of the way along the highway. Oh, no. <laughs> About a month later, he was diagnosed with bladder cancer that medications would not help. Oh, dear. And after about six months after the diagnosis, he passed away. His friend who was telling the story said he told him he believed his instant change in health was due to this encounter by staying in the house with the black eyed children. And for this next one, I'm actually probably going to go into more detail later on in a another episode but trigger warning this has child sexual assault it is a murder trial can it chase murders but there's a mention of black eyed children at the end Kinnick Chase is about 20 minutes north of Birmingham, and in the past, it was used during for wartime training in both world wars. In the 1950s, it was known for its natural beauty, but in the 1960s, the reputation shifted to a much darker tone. December 1st, 1964, a nine-year-old girl riding her bike was approached by a man claiming to be her uncle, Lynn. He told her her aunt sent him to take her to go Christmas present shopping. Well, who wouldn't hop in the car? Mm, me. But it's Christmas shopping. I don't like Christmas. Okay. He assaulted, raped, and attempted to kill her through strangulation. He then dumped her in a ditch and left her there to die. He assumed she was already dead, I bet. Probably. She miraculously was discovered in time, and she barely survived. The doctors estimated that if she would have been found 20 minutes later, she wouldn't have. Scary. Yeah. She was unable to give police enough evidence about the man, which caused the case to go cold. In September 8, 1965, 
six-year-old Margaret Reynolds disappeared on her way to school during her lunch break in a Birmingham suburb. Her mother notified the police when Margaret didn't return home for dinner, and an investigation began, which involved 150 police officers that conducted over 25,000 interviews. A lot of interviews. Yeah, it's important work. Yeah. By December 30th, Margaret still had not been located when five-year-old Diane Tift vanished while walking a short distance between her home and her grandmother's house. Oh. A large-scale police search was initiated and focused on identifying someone inconspicuous in the area. All abductions occurred along the A34 roadway. Don't walk on the roadway. Fix that, didn't we? (laughs) A breakthrough moment came when the brother of a man named Raymond Morris stepped forward. He told them that Raymond had been in the area during the time of these disappearances and that he possessed a car and that he had concerning sexual interests. Ooh. Not just ooh because of the interest. Ooh because you went to your brother and told him about it. Yeah. I also probably should have mentioned this to somebody before people disappeared, but I can understand (sighs) why they can't really do anything if there's no physical proof. Or, Or any action yet. Yeah. The police investigated and found that Raymond was a respected figure in society, and he served as foreman at his workplace. He was also happily married with two children. Raymond was able to provide an alibi for both abductions during these police interviews, and he was cleared of suspicion and released. On January 12, 1965, a workman discovered the lifeless body of Diane Tift in a ditch near Canuck Chase. A police photographer documented the crime scene that night, and noticed something interesting in the photographs. The developed photos revealed an outline of another girl beneath Diane. This was only caught due to the angle of the camera flash. So there's two bodies? Yes. Diane's body was moved, and Margaret, who was also raped and strangled, was pressed into the soft soil of the field underneath. Now he's just making a tower. Yeah. From what I understand, neither of them were actually buried. It was just the earth was soft and... I guess, said indented. That's just disgusting. Yeah. On August 14th, 1966, 10-year-old Jane Taylor vanished while riding her bike near Canuck Chase. Two months later, two young girls disclosed an unsettling encounter with a man named Raymond Morris. They claimed he took them into his apartment, had them undress in separate rooms, and then took photos of them. Again, Raymond was brought in for questioning, but the police couldn't locate the photos that was mentioned by the girls. And the girls' testimonies didn't perfectly align. How old were they? I don't know. It I'm, just said young. That, I mean, that could be why they don't align. Yeah. And also, if it did happen, they're traumatized. How is it? <laughs> As a result of this, Raymond was released without charges. Again, the report was also made to a different police department that was unaware of Raymond's identity and of things like this going on. But if they would have had gone to the correct police department, Raymond's interview was mistakenly filed under his brother's name. Oh, no. So they wouldn't have been able to do much about it. That's terrible. Yeah. Clerical work is important. It should uh, be done impor- that's, er, that, properly. That's before the um, internet had a huge database of yeah. things. This was a ongoing issue forever until recently. Mm-hmm. On August 19th, a man stopped by where seven-year-old Christine Darby was playing. And he was asking for directions from her and her friends. Despite being pointed in the town's direction, he lured Christine into his car and drove the opposite direction to where they had pointed him to. The police activated the stop plan, which involved three forces to close a large area if another girl was abducted. But the problem was it took 25 minutes for Christine's disappearance to be reported, which allowed the abductor to drive beyond the restricted zone. A little boy witnessed noticed the guy who was a local due to the way he pronounced the nearby town. It's kind of like, we'll use Appalachia as an example. We say Appalachia here in Appalachia, and others call it Appalachia. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming that's what they meant by it. They made a list of thousands of local men aged 21 to 50 to interview. Also, an adult is never going to need a kid's help. Three days later, Christine was found in a field. She was a victim of sexual assault and suffocation. A witness identified the suspect's car as being a gray Austin A55 or A60, and this also aided in the creation of a police sketch. A massive investigation involved interviewing 54,000 homeowners and 23,000 gray Austin owners. 
and this eventually led them right back to Raymond Morris. A little bit of a side note, if you look up this guy's picture, he reminds me of the guy, you remember the movie Bless This Child? Oh, I love that movie. The bad guy? The one that burnt the dude and she, yeah. Yeah, he looks similar to that guy. Oh. His face. Yeah, okay. Kind of looks like it. Despite being interviewed three times at this point, Morris was again released. This time because his wife provided an alibi for him for the day of Christine's abduction. She told them that he was out shopping with her. I hate to say it, but you should never trust the spouse. Or even the parents, unless there's two collaborating. Yeah. But a lot of times that's the only people you have to ask who had been around them enough. Yeah. I don't know. I really don't know how I would be in this situation if police came to my door and asked about Joey. I really have no idea how I would react. I don't care. (laughs) I won't lie to the police for you. I'm not that kind of friend or relative. I just don't. I'm not getting drugged in on your mess. So you best hope uh, you told them the truth because I yeah. will. Because don't you have a chance of getting time yourself if you're caught lying about that? Yeah. Interfering with an investigation. I just won't do it. I just wouldn't dare. Mm. If you're that kind of person and you know me, just don't involve me in it. And yeah. you're free to get other people to back you up. I won't do it. Yeah. I'll tell the truth. On May 21st, 1968, the police received a distressing call reporting the abduction of two girls ages five and two right outside of their home. The stop plan was swiftly activated, leading to the apprehension of a driver who claimed that the girls in his back seat were friends of his daughter. The little girls denied knowing him and said he put tape on their mouths whenever they got inside the vehicle. That's embarrassing. The thing is, kids could say something like that out of the blue, though. You never know. Yeah, they can. Uh, but this time it's kind of hard to I guess to he deny. had ripped the tape off of them when he realized he was getting stopped. On the right side, they knew better and they, they told the truth. It was soon revealed, however, that. He was not the perpetrator responsible for the previous murders. Although he was another predator that was captured, which is good, the child serial killer was still on the loose. Oh, dear. Yeah. So, I guess good that you caught him, not good that the serial killer is this guy was just still going, wandering around. This guy just wanted to be a copycat, had, or always had the desire and just decided to act on it now that this other guy would take the blame. Possibly. that's That makes sense. You should have just not done that. Yeah. But, yeah. But, <laughs> well, the original one shouldn't have done that either. No. Nobody yeah. should do that. Uh, not only is it against the law, it is majorly morally wrong. Mm-hmm. Later in November 1968, Raymond Morris attempted to abduct a 10-year-old girl. This one was also named Margaret. It was Margaret Alton. And he tried to do so by enticing her with fireworks. A neighbor was watching at the time, so Raymond ended up letting her go. The neighbor happened to write down the license plate number, but they mixed up two of the numbers. Um, I mean, that's a big change. Yeah, but the investigator went through all of the combinations of the license number, which eventually, again, led back to Raymond. They have uh, like AI and algorithms for that now, don't they? Yeah, I would hope so. I can't remember numbers. I, I think at names. this time it was index cards. Oh, no. Or something. In yeah. the article I was reading, it said something about cards. The police investigation of Raymond's apartment unveiled pornographic photos of his wife's five-year-old niece. Oh, no. And that's when she decided to expose that she had lied for his alibi for Christine Darby's murder. I bet she's thinking, oh, what have I done? Mm -hmm. On Friday of November 1968, the police pulled Raymond over. And they had been, I believe, before this, watching him him and seeing what his routine was. Yeah. A lot of times they'll try to uh, catch them in the, like, not the act of murder, obviously, but the trying to collect someone. Yeah. It seems like something they would do. Yeah. His response was immediately, oh, God, was it my wife? Pretty much asking if she took back her alibi. Yes. Yes, she did. Because you're a piece of shit. I figured he was trying to lay the blame on her. Oh, no. (laughs) Did she do this? I knew it. Well, that's what they said. He said in the article I read. I don't know how I would have took that if he would have said that to me. He was charged with abuse of his niece. And police noticed that the way he photographed his niece was similar to the way he left the bodies of the other girls. For example, one sock was left on while the other was pulled off. Gross. During the trial, he was said to keep a stone face and showing no emotion. What would he do? Why do they expect people to break down and cry over something they clearly only regret getting caught for? Yeah. That always annoys me when they try to judge people's emotion on the stand. Yeah. It doesn't have any impact on it. I don't care how they feel. Yeah. Um, 
even if you're sitting there bawling, you still did this. Yeah. So. If it was like a manslaughter situation, I understand maybe keeping track of the emotion. But Yeah. A young girl jumped up during the trial and screamed, that's the man who did it to me. But she was quickly removed from the courtroom because they didn't know if police had put her up to it or if that yeah. was true. So they couldn't really use that. And it was just disrupting the court. So I can understand that. I bet he was like, what? Who are you? <laughs> Either way, you're still a shitty person. So even if it wasn't true, you still would have deserved that. Raymond Morris was found guilty of the murder of Christine Darby and the attempted kidnapping and assaulting of two other girls. He was never charged for the murders of Margaret Reynolds or Diane Tift. Their cases remain unsolved, though it's very likely he was the one who murdered them. There just wasn't enough evidence collected to prove it. He was sentenced to life in prison, and he insisted he was innocent until his death in prison in 2014. In the 1980s, reports surfaced of unsettling encounters with a black-eyed little girl in Canic Chase. The first documented sighting occurred in 1982 when an 18-year-old was hanging out with her friends. She heard a child's cry for help, so she followed the sound. And that's when she encountered a six to eight year old girl running in the opposite direction and was repeatedly pleading for assistance. Okay, that sounds more reasonable to intervene. Yeah. They're moving and saying something instead of knocking on your door. Yeah. Despite her efforts, the witness was unable to catch up with this child. <laughs> and in the process, she tripped and cut her big toe. As darkness fell, the little girl disappeared into dense woods, leaving the woman alone. She told the authorities, which came by and was aided by dogs, but no evidence of this girl's presence was ever found. Later, the woman learned about Raymond's child killings in the area. That, I'm sure, led her to believe that maybe it was the ghost of one of the little girls. In 2014, the year of Raymond's death, numerous sightings of the black-eyed girl were reported in Canic Chase. One account described a couple walking their dog when they heard a giggling girl with black eyes. Creepy. She, yeah, she vanished into thick trees after their eerie encounter. Another witness recalled a young girl with completely black eyes in Birch's Valley. They said the girl had her hands over her eyes at first and her head was tilted as if she had been hung. Ooh. Time to go. Yeah. <laughs> You're not screaming for help this time. I'm leaving. When she put her arms to her side, it revealed... The eyes that were pitch black. Definitely time to go now. There ain't no help for you, little girl. I can't help you with that. Some speculate that the black-eyed child may be demons leading people towards potentially hazardous locations. And instances of paranormal activity continued in 2014 with a mother who discovered a ghostly figure near the tree that her children were climbing on in Canuck Rock. In 2015, a paranormal investigator, Tom Buckmaster, captured footage of a little girl in a white dress in Canic Chase. This was accompanied by mysterious voices and a rock that randomly rolled by them. Now we're going to go into some theories as to what these black-eyed children are. Some think that they are alien hybrids. Or something radioactive. I don't know. <laughs> well, they think they're a result of extraterrestrial... Terrestrial. <laughs> extraterrestrial experimentation. That could be it. Pretty much trying to create hybrids with human traits. And the black eyes just never got fixed, I guess. Which yeah. leads to pretty much about the same abductions. This theory suggests that these beings have been abducted and experimented on. Yeah, they're just missing children mm. throughout the years. That should be looked into. There's a lot of missing kids. Some propose that black-eyed children are agents of a larger force aiming for global control. Well, that could be the aliens. Yeah. Uh, any kind of, of it. Goes in there. And then there's conspiracy theories that suggest these encounters are a result of secret government experiments involving manipulation or creation of entities for covert purposes. Nobody will ever notice the black-eyed child. It's... Uh, Breeding experiments for hybrid evolution. There's a belief that these encounters are part of an experiment to create a hybrid or an evolved form of human that is capable of surviving challenging conditions caused by global warming. I think we can assume that gene therapy is the best plan for that. Mm. Or perhaps less fossil fuel? <laughs> just, just, you know, putting that out there. The next theory is Chinese hungry ghosts. 
that are seeking something unfulfilled in their past lives or spirits that cannot rest in peace and have a hunger that will never be filled. I think I mentioned Chinese hungry ghosts in a previous episode, but I don't remember which one. No idea. I think they come up in like Grimm, the series Grimm, oh. and uh, certain tabletop games I've got, but that's about it. Yeah. There's also the theory that they are vampires. The, yeah, energy vampires. It's the idea that the black-eyed children could be a modern interpretation of vampires with their hypnotic eyes and mysterious nature. Vampires, I think you were right. Um, but you mentioned a type of vampires. Energy vampires? Energy vampires. That kind of makes sense. Because mm-hmm. the people that let them in or are near them seem to feel dizzy or have health issues Yeah. after. American Horror Story goes into this theory a little bit. Cool. The black pill thing. Isn't that the one that goes switches to aliens too? I don't know if it switches to aliens. I can't remember much about it. I know that uh, it it's like a huge outbreak in LA after they get near the end or some spoilers. Mm-hmm. Some say the strange dizziness or confusion that they feel could be the young vampires trying to turn them into vampires, but that they have yet to learn how to complete the process. It's weird. That would piss me off. Go ahead and turn me into a vampire. I don't know if I want to be an energy vampire, though. They're the boring ones. Hmm. <laughs> you only say that because of the show. <laughs> no, not just that. <laughs> I, I, I guess there's energy vampires in the Dresden Files. You get the uh, white court vampires who are, uh, they feed off of, depending on what clan you are, uh, lust or pain or fear, stuff like that. Yeah. Those are kind of fun and less boring. Hmm. Some believe they are demonic entities that appear with a sinister agenda and paranormal abilities. Hmm. And then some interpret encounters with black-eyed children just as bad omens that indicate impending misfortune or like the black dog. significant events. Like the what? The black dog. Oh, yeah. I guess the most popular form of this is the bad luck from a black cat crossing your path. That is not true. That's not true. At least I don't think it is. I've lived with two black cats for years now and... Knock on wood. I've always been unlucky even before my black cat. <laughs> what are you talking about? Uh, could be worse. Uh, I don't have an opinion. I think they're fairies. Oh. There's also the idea that black-eyed children are inhabitants of a parallel universe that occasionally cross over into our reality and cause disturbances. The we folk. Yeah. Speculations suggest that they might be entities that cross from other dimensions as a way of explaining their unsettling presence from the fourth dimension Mm. and there's also the time travelers theory which i believe would kind of go into this a little bit who's sending children back in time (laughs) please stop keep an eye on your children (laughs) there's another theory that is that they are psychological manifestations oh someone's body telling them something's wrong yeah they uh they could possibly be induced by stress or fear but the ones where two people see them at once is weird. I have all kinds of stress. Where are my black-eyed children? There's also a belief that they are guardians of the afterlife and that they serve as messengers or as guardians related to the afterlife. Collectors of that, souls. Yeah. Psychopomps, I think the Greeks would call them. Yeah. That they are maybe warning from realms beyond, but that, I don't know if that one's weird to me. Maybe they're just Mothman's babies. Yeah, possibly. He had that effect on people, too. Mm-mm. There's also no- the notion that black-eyed children are cursed souls seeking resolution or redemption, appearing to fulfill a karma-related purpose or a special destiny, which uh, it's kind of the a little bit different from the Chinese hungry ghost. But The earlier ones wanted to go to the Mortal Kombat movie, Beth. Yeah. They really had a purpose. <laughs> it, well. And not, not the new one, I probably. never watched The old it. one. The old ones, which were... Uh, 80s to the extreme. There's many other things you can find online about people's encounters. I'm sure there's indie games children. like that too. I bet you could find a few indie games where you encounter black eyed children. Yeah. But so. that's all that I have. Well, it's been an interesting story. Kind of weird. Yeah. Lots of theories, but that's what you get into in these things. Well, it's been entertaining. I, like I said, I'm just convinced they're fairies. Mm-mm. Simple as that. Fairy, fairy people or half fairy people. I like the vampire theory. I guess. Energy vampire could be a thing. I think these people just made it all up. <laughs> I don't believe this kind of story usually. 
uh, if there's photos or anything, I'd believe it, but I'm not inclined to. Yeah. The only real thing about this whole story was there was a child molesting murderer. Yeah. Was this one of your favorites to cover? I found this one interesting, but I... Some are more believable than others. And Yeah. But I'm also glad that I did this because I found that case, which... Yeah. I the case all on its own was uh, worth covering. Yeah. But no, I, the theories, I believe, is what interested me in this. Because most of the stories are pretty much the same. Different people, maybe different settings. But at least a Mothman happened in one, like one close region for the most part, except for the Chicago yeah, outbreak. This apparently happens all over the world. Uh huh. I didn't hear about like more than two continents. Yeah. There was also a shorter story from a witness that was visiting the UK that seen a little girl in her hotel with black eyes. Okay. But it was shorter and I had to pick and choose. If most of these had had happened in the UK or, you know, Scotland, Ireland, all those places mm-hmm. that you would assume to be a fairy haven, I and, would have more reason to say fairy. Yeah. But no, they've been reported all over. I'll keep my eye out for unsettling children, even the ones with black eyes. <laughs> well, I guess that's it for this one, folks. I'll add a link in the description. It will be a link tree link. So once you click on it, it'll show you a whole bunch of other links. There'll be our socials. You can reach out to us there. Give us ideas and things to cover. The first one you see will be our, at the top of the list, will be our website, our home site for all of our podcasts. We have this one there. We have uh, Brother Knows Quest, a podcast where I tell Beth here about tabletop role-playing games. And there'll also be Leveling Duo. It's a podcast me and my friend Dakota do uh, talking about our favorite video games. Just different ones. Some of the new ones, some of the older ones. Then there'll be a YouTube link. You can watch a stream or listen to our episodes there if you want to. Soon, we're trying to make it uh, fix um, a subscription. If you want to subscribe for one to however many dollars, we're still working on the tiers. And uh, just keep an eye out there if you're listening. And eventually, we'll have something there. You get bonus content or something like that. Or, like I said, we're working on that, but I wanted to let you know now that we're planning it. Uh, as for the YouTube streams, I've been playing Elden Ring. Beth plays a little Sims here and there. We'll try to add some extra stuff in there soon. Maybe start playing some tabletop role-playing games, things like that. Like, subscribe, share with people you know. Appreciate it. There's an email in that link tree. It'll just send straight to Beth. It's horrifichistoryhauntings at gmail or something like that. It'll be there. And message her. Let her know what's going on. Uh, give us a good story or a subject to cover or tell us what you think. And if you want, well, share, read it out to people. Uh, make sure you let us know if you do or don't want us to put your name or if you want us to read it at all. Thank you for listening. I've been Rami. And I'm Beth. This has been HH&H. Goodbye.